Well, we're back with Joe from Red Judius, but hold on a minute. Look who I've got over here. I've also got Alfadi, our good friend. Many years, Alfadi, we worked together. Oh, goodness sakes, how much have we have we unpacked this material on the origins of Islam? And now what we're doing is we're looking at the Quran itself. But we're not just looking at the Quran. We brought you on board, Alfadi, because we want we need your expertise. We need your help here. Uh, because we're going to be looking at Arabic here. And you are the expert in Arabic. You're doing your doctoral thesis in this very area. And so we need your help because Joe, who does speak Arabic, he knows Hebrew, he is Jew. He has, he doesn't, most people will not take him seriously if he starts rattling off on all grammatical structures that are Arabic. So that's why we need your help because what we're going to look at is the Dome of the Rock. We want to look at the Dome of the Rock. We want to look at those inscriptions. Now, we've already done this with other people. Odons look at those inscriptions. So has Mel. So has Thomas. In fact, so have we, haven't we, Al Fadi? We've looked at those inscriptions before. But we. That is true. Looked at that is true. Yes, we did. Yeah. And remember, Al Fadi, when we looked at them, we looked at them as an attack against Christianity, against the Christian orthodoxy of that age by Abd al Malik, attacking these other Christian views. And because of the soup that was there, what Jew and what Red Judaism, or I should say Joe from Red Judaism, wants to do, he wants to say, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. When you look at the Arabic, when you look at and take out some of the dots and some of the vowels and restructure it, you can see that actually there may be another way to look at these inscriptions. So, Joe, you're going to come up with a whole nother uh, narrative, one that I've not heard before. And I know Al Fadi's not heard this, and I'm sure all those who are listening have not heard this. So, over to you, uh, Joe. Good to have you on board. Thanks for coming. I know it's something like five o'clock in the morning for you. Uh, but nonetheless, you've broken yourself up, throw that water on your face, and you're willing now to let's uh, to open up this area on the Dome of the Rock. Is there another way to read these inscriptions? Over to you. Shalom, Jay, and Shalom, Al-Fadi. Uh, thank you for having me back again. Yes, well, I'm going to try and present a very different point of view today. And um, as, as I know, a, a lot of what could be said here has already been said by um, Odon and Inara, uh, with uh, one important exception, which sometimes changes everything, and that's that I'm coming from a, 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 a Jewish perspective, specifically actually coming from a Judo-Arabic perspective. Now, I've, we've talked about Judo-Arabic before on the show, and I should just correct you, I don't speak Arabic. Um, I, I know Judo-Arabic, which is really helpful because um, it helps. If you know Judo-Arabic, you know enough Aramaic, enough Hebrew, enough uh, Arabic, and enough even Greek to be able to... Um, uh, sort of follow all sorts of things. So it was a very good way to start. But let me first uh, state that um, what, what we all share of common, in common, of course, is that we all agree that the 7th century religion was more Christian than, than Islamic, as we understand Islam, and that Islam really only began to evolve in the 8th century and didn't begin uh, to reach Spain until the 9th century. But I think I'm the only one who's saying that while some of the authors of Abbasid Islam seem to have been Nazarene adoptionists, the authors of these Umayyad hadiths which is the origin of the Quran, um, the authors of the Umayyad Sadith were certainly not Nazarene adoptionists. That's my argument. My argument, of course, is that they were more monophysite in line with Peter von Sivers, of course, the early work of Christoph Luxemburg and Gunther Luning when they're talking about the Syriac um, sources. And also, even Odon Lafontaine, of course, have, has talked about that too. So anyway, let's get into this. I'm going to share the screen. So this is the Judaic view on the Dome of the Rock. Now, you've, of course, as we've just heard, you've heard how it seems from a Christian perspective. And now Jay has been uh, has very graciously invited me to explain what it looks like from a Judaic perspective. So here is a little map showing the location of, well, this is the old city in Jerusalem uh, from above, looking from above. This is the location of the Dome of the Rock here. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre is over here. And this is the Western Wall, the Kotel, where all the you, you may have seen uh, there's a little plaza where the, the Jews pray facing this wall of the of the Temple Mount. Um, and the from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, this is the center where, of pilgrimage for all the Christians in, in uh, traditional Christians in, in, in history have gone to make pilgrimage to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, the, 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 which is the tomb of Jesus, the crucifixion site of Jesus. And his tomb is, is, is right in the same giant, same complex. From this point, it's impossible to see the Dome of the Rock. You can't see the Dome of the Rock from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So um, if this was for to be in the face of the Christians, it's an odd place to have all these inscriptions. The best place would be to have it in the plaza outside of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, 
to be in the face of the Christians. But it completely overshadows and dominates the um, the Jewish uh, quarter, which is right next to it, um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, is is covering the holiest spot in in Judaism, this uh, dome of the rock. The rock, of course, is the rock of uh, where Abraham is supposed to have sacrificed Isaac. It's the the rock where the um, holy of holies was supposed to be. Um, it's uh, underneath this rock uh, is uh, what we call the well of souls in Judaism. The well of souls is supposed to be the place where all the all the souls of humanity are kept before they are born. They come from the well of souls down here. Um, Joe, I'm going to jump in real quickly. Joe, I'm just going to ask a yep. question because while you're still on this map here, you're saying that the Jewish quarter was that what is there. That's modern day Jewish quarter. Yes. Uh, what about the Muslim quarter? There was no Muslim quarter back in 692. So what would that have been at that time? Because that would also play into what you're saying now. Yes. No. Of course, there would be there would have been Christians dominating the whole area. Um, but the, for, the what I'm trying to say is the point, the place of pilgrimage. For, I mean, if you look at the very top of the map, you can't get it. But the, the stations of the cross go go at the, along the top side of the Muslim quarter, and then they come down to the Holy Church of the Holy Sepulcher. They don't go anywhere near the, the Dome of the Rock. So um, if you were trying to be, you know, get at Christians, you you should at least do something along the the the, the stations of the cross, the the, the, the the route of the pilgrimage, or or at the Church of the Holy Sepulcher rather than you know really on the outskirts of it on on the temple mount here which uh, under canon law was actually off limits the, there was a church a byzantine church where al-aqsa is you see al-aqsa down here there was a byzantine church there but this rock itself was off limits under canon law i understand this from uh, a, 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 an orthodox uh, bishop from um in israel in, in from nazareth actually uh, this was off limits uh, to Christians. They were not supposed to go up there because there's no need for them to, um, to, 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 to have any reverence for the rock where the sacrifice of Isaac took place or where the sacrifices of the temple took place because the sacrifice of Jesus was much more, you know, it surpasses everything. It makes everything else redundant. Whereas for the Jews, this is the holiest spot. And when Nehemiah ben Hushiel, who we've spoken about many times on this uh, channel before, and done on my channel too who led this um uh jewish uh, um, army in to conquer jerusalem at the beginning of the seventh century um when he his people were clearing the temple mount there they put in the well of souls this is the story this is there's no proof of this. this is just a, the story the Jew, the jewish uh, or the correct jewish story they put in their uh, on, in the well of souls they supposedly had the ark of the covenant the uh, tablets of stone which they put underneath there um, ready to rebuild the temple. That's what they were going to do. You know, and Nehemiah ben Hushiel was going to declare himself the Messiah, no doubt. So this was a really sacred spot for, it's the most sacred spot for the, for the Jews. And um, so those inscriptions... Can I just, I'm just suggesting interrupt one more time? We do yeah. know, though, on that, at that and, and, and this would actually support what you're saying, that in 692, when the Dome of the Rock was built, it was a rubbish heap, was it not? because it was it not was a rub it yes it was a rubbish heap when nehemiah ben hushiel's armies came in because the christians had no regard for it it was not it was not it, it from the time when um helen um the mother of constantine she did all the excavations in the third in the in the fourth century she did all the excavations in in the in the old city which was previously concreted over it was aeola capitola beforehand but helen the mother of constantine um came in and she was a very devout Christian and she she did a lot of excavations there but the temple the Dome of the Rock itself that part was as you say a rubbish heap it was kept as a rubbish heap until Nehemiah but Hushiel's people came in and they started to clear at that time um, they started to clear it but that they were evicted in the 610s um, Hosrau changed his mind went against them kicked the, the Jews out they had to go and wall themselves up in Edessa which is what Sebios is talking about and um uh, 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 that was left until it was re reconquered by Omar, who um, actually makes, there's reference to him talking to one of the soldiers of uh, Nehemiah ben Hushiel, asking him for specific directions, exactly where were you clearing the, 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 the mount, where were you starting to clear the mount to build the, the temple? And this, uh, this uh, Jew, his name is Kabbal Akbar, tells him, this is where it was. And so Omar starts to try and rebuild it or starts to clear it. They put up a wooden shrine according to the reports of um, various church fathers. 
And um, but that was abandoned. They 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 left it. Um, he changed his mind. He gave up on the idea. I say he because he converted to Christianity. That's my my view on that. And then it was left until as uh, Abdul Malik um, finished the job. And of course, when when the Jews saw Abdul Malik building things here, they would have been very excited. They would have been saying all sorts of wonderful things about him. They probably would have been comparing him to Kurush Cyrus, Cyrus the, the Great, who was a friend to the Jews. They would have been very ecstatic. And then at the end of after building it all, uh, he puts, he or maybe his successor puts these inscriptions up uh, around the rock which is really in the face of um, all the Jews who were going there to to and ex ecstatic about what was what was happening, so it's a it was a big a big slap in the face really from the from the from the Judaic or from non messianic Judaic perspective. Just okay, so, let just me move so, on. Just so yes. people know the dates that you're talking yes. about, Ushiel, uh, ben yes. Ushiel would be about prior to six ten. Umar would be 638. Yes. You also have Muawiyah, yeah. who has also built a building on the Dome of the Rock in 661. Yeah. And now you're we're yeah. looking at 692. The Dome of the Rock that we're looking at there in the picture would have been built in 691, 692. Just so everybody knows the dates that we're looking at. These are all in the 7th That's century. Right. That's right. So if you wanted the support of the of the Jews, you would you, you would have to do something there. But um, which Muawiyah did as well. Thank you for bringing him up too. But in the end, um, it's, it was actually uh, everything which was written on the inside there, when all these um, uh, Arab-speaking Jews would have been praying, they would have, they would have been reading these messages in, I say, Judah Arabic, which is what um, I say, Lisan Arabi Mubinis. We'll get into that later. All right, then. So this is the first inscription which is relevant for us on the outer, uh, uh, the outside. Uh, well, it's, it's, the, it's the outer part of the inner ambulatory. Um, as it's been gone through before with everybody, I'm not going to go over and repeat the idea that, yes, we've covered the idea that actually the word Mahmed refers to Jesus here. It's all about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. But it does have this point, which is important. Um, and uh, uh, this, uh, this is the key word here. This is what it says. By the way, this NW is Northwest uh, Face, North Face. So it says NW for Northwest, N for North. It'll say S for South, etc. So this is the northwest face. This is the first um, thing which we've got to, to look at on the outside as, you, as you're going in. And it says that um, he did not... Uh, and can you, you can pronounce, correct my pronunciation if, if you like, because I, I don't speak Arabic. I know Judo Arabic. So if, if you can correct my pronunciation, that would be great. I'll, I'll no, you're, you're doing fine. Uh, beget, basically. Yeah. Well... The word actually we have here, if I'm going to click, I'm going to click on it and open up the link here. So um, the, because beget would be from, would be, would be um, lalid, like lam yalid wa lam yulid. He, that, he doesn't beget and he's not begotten. And the word is walid. So it would be um, a, a different verb. What we have here is the, it, it's quoting um, Surah um, uh, 17 verse 111. One, one. Let me just, so. And it's got uh, taken the, the 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 I've also covered this in previous videos, so I won't go into it too much. But it's the idea of to take, uh, to adopt, to take on, to uh, to to um, to assume. You can also to assume something, um, to select, um, to choose. So it's uh, it's got um, it's got this kind of meaning. He's saying it's saying very literally. I'll I'll, I'll leave this here for for the people to see it here. That lamb, this is a negative uh, particle. That's very important to note. Mm -hmm. it's, there's a strong negative particle here. And so he has not yatahid. Uh, he has not yatahid taken, adopted, assumed, taken on. So, so adoption is in view here, technically speaking. Adop that's right. Adoption is in view. He hasn't adopted a son. This is relevant uh, to attacking. The standard Judaic position, which most Jews will know until they get to the age of 40 and are allowed to start, start, start studying um, Jewish uh, theology. Most, it's actually a tradition in Judaism. You're not allowed to study deep Jewish matters until you get to the age of 40. Um, so um, it's, it's until you get to the age of 40, your view on the Messiah would be that um, um, Solomon, David, Saul, any of the, the Jewish messiahs throughout history, um, were adopted sons or adopted as a son of God. They're not really children of God. Uh, the children of God are the angels. Um, and um, this, um, 
is saying that no, he didn't adopt any of the messiahs as his son. That's that's basically the first attack against the, a Jewish position here. I, I, you know the the Judaic position has been spoken about the the Judo Nazarenes. You've heard a lot about them being adoptionists, and they were fundamentally Jews. Remember that adoptionist position is a heresy for Christians. This is not a, a, a Christian position. Christians don't believe in adoptionism. Um, right. It was outlawed. It's um, it, for many times, but the council. Of, it was the uh, when they out when they put the, the anathema on on Nestorius. That was against adoptionism. So um, um, it's not a Christian position. They're attacking here. What they're attacking here is the Judo Nazarene position, which is just a reflection of an of, a, of the regular Jewish position. So that's the first attack there. So let's get back to it then. So um, so we have this. Uh, First attack on the Jewish position on the outside there from Surah 117. So, um, and then uh, on the inside, on the inner ambulatory, these are the, these are the inscriptions which we see on the inside. So this is the south facing wall. This is the first, this is where the story starts, facing south. Um, and it's, uh, it's basically saying, uh, as you know, according to the, the system which I, uh, I, I use to reverse um, or to, 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 yeah, to reverse the, um, the Quran to a pre-sort of Quranic state. And these passages are from, from the Quran. Well, actually, the Quran is probably based on these passages, to be honest. But anyway, uh, that's the Islamic Quran is based on these passages. These are the original, um, um, this is the original Umayyad texts, the original Umayyad form. So we reverse this Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim. And uh, we say that it means in the name of uh, the Father, the Beloved, and all compassion, love. So the Father, of course, we know. Uh, the beloved Son, we know. And compassion, love. God is love. This is the um, this is um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, but it's it's not uh, it's not in a, a direct. Uh, it, this is not very in your face yet. This is actually quite like getting your foot in the door. Because if you were to start with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, probably they wouldn't read any more. Jews would just stop at that point and say, right, we're not reading that. So by opening it up with a, a, a like a euphemistic way of referring to the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit with Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim instead, then you've got your foot in the door and it's likely they're going to read on next. The next thing that they read uh, here saying, um, La ilaha illallah, um, there is no God but God, uh, Wahid, uh, he's, he's one. And, yeah. and yeah. La, and no, Sharik uh, al there's no shirk to, uh, with him. And it says, his is all the sovereignty and all the praise, and um, he quickens and he gives death. This is a quote from Deuteronomy 32, 39. So you're starting to get your foot in the door immediately. This is the first wall you're looking at. The south wall is where it begins. You're saying, you're not saying directly in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You're, you're doing it euphemistically. So people are not turning their backs. Rahman and Rahim, these are words we use in Judaism to praise God. We use exactly the same words. This is in completely intelligible Judah Arabic. This is Lisan Arabi Mubin for us. This is Leshon Arabi Nevin. This is how we say it in our uh, pronunciation, <laughs> which is different from Leshon Arabi, which is not Nevin. For us, it's we, Leshon Arabi, the, the language of Arabic is not intelligible for, for Jews, for Judah Arabic speakers. But Leshon Arabi Nevin means the intelligible Arabic language, a form of Arabic which is intelligible for us. So this is exactly intelligible Arabic. This is why I always have much easier time with um, Quranic inscriptions and things like that than I do with speaking Arabic, because I, I can't speak Arabic. But I do understand all of this. This is very easy for me. So um, so what we've got here, though, you've, you've basically got your foot in the door and you're quoting Deuteronomy. And that's great. You know, it's even the lie, la, 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 it's there in Deuteronomy 32, 39. If you want to check it out yourselves later, go and have a look. It's there and it's basically a quotation. And then it says he has power over all things. And then it says, Mahmed Abdullah wa Rasul wa Rasul. So it's saying, blessed, praised is his um, servant and angel. Allah's servant and angel. The father's servant and angel is praised. Rasul, um, this is um, this is Rosh, Roshel, basically, in, in Hebrew. It's not spelled the same way. It's spelled differently. But Roshel means the chief angel, the, the archangel, the head, the head angel. So it's saying, Blessed is his um, his servant and angel. And the word servant also 
uh, means sons as well. I'll prove that later from the Judaic perspective. So let's move on to that. So it's basically saying, praise this is servant and angel. So, so you're, taking, you're taking Muhammad here, uh, not as a, a name, but you're taking it as uh, invoking blessings, basically. Is that correct? That's correct. Oh, I've also got to say that why why choose this particular word, Muhammad? Because in the he this is actually also a Hebrew word. And in the Hebrew Bible, this word appears a few times as it is. But when it appears, it's usually in reference to the temple. So here you are, you've come, you're the Jew who's come to do pilgrimage to the most holy spot. Um, and you and you and and this is the this spot is what we call Mahmad. This spot is the Mahmad of Israel. This is this is the, the, the cherished thing of Israel, the, the temple. This is the cherished place. You, you, you're starting to read this inscription. It's quoting Deuteronomy. You say, oh, I, I know this passage. This is a very famous passage. We say this in prayers. And the first thing it says is after the, after the quoting the, the passage from Deuteronomy, the first thing it says is Mahmed. That's what we understand is going to be this cherished spot. This cherished location is not a cherished location. Mahmed is God's servant and Rasul. Rochelle. So it's like, well, who is this servant in Rochelle? But uh, Mahmed is why I thought this place is the Mahmed of Israel. Who is this Mahmed then? What's this Mahmed they're talking about? What's this praised thing? If it's not this spot, and it's saying that the praised place, the praised thing of, of Israel is not a piece of rock. The praised thing of Israel is uh, God's servant and Rasul. So this is the first message. It's completely Judaic perspective I'm giving you here. So you get it from our from a from a from a seventh century Judaic point of view. You have to understand that those seventh century Jews were expecting the Temple Mount to be rebuilt here. This is where it was supposed to happen. This was not what Nehemiah promised them, what Omar promised them before he converted. And, and here we have the building, and it's telling you right off the bat that, you know what? This piece of rock is not your Mahmed. It's not your cherished thing. Your cherished thing is God's servant and Ros uh, Rochelle, Ras Ras uh, Rasul. Okay, just Chief just Angel. so we just so I'm clear, and just so everybody else is clear, because so far every time we've looked at this verse, Muhammad Rasulallah, it is always I've always been told this is what Thomas has said, this is what Mel has said, yeah. this is what Murad has said. Uh, uh, even last year, he said this that this is was that's Muhammad would be the praised one would be Jesus Christ. You're saying Correct. this is not Jesus Christ. You're saying this is the temple itself. Is that what are you then? Are you saying this is what Jews would see when they read it? It's but was that the intention of Abdul Malik when he wrote it? Well, the, the, the language is very clear, Mevin. It's very clear for us. It says Mahmed is is this is God's servant and God's Rasul, Rochelle, chief angel, are uh, Mahmed. As and that's a that's a clash in your in your mind when you've been reading, for example, Ezekiel. And various other and Hosea and you and you know that Mahmed is this spot, and so well this spot that I'm standing on is Mahmed, right? And they're saying and and this wall is telling you, the spot you're standing on is not Mahmed. Only God's servant and and Rochelle Rasul are Mahmed. So it's it's kind of, it's confronting you and it's confronting your worldview. Do you understand? I see. I see. Okay. Okay. So it's confronting the Jewish worldview that this rock, this temple mount, this is not God's Mahmed. God's Mahmed is, is his servant and his Rochel, his Rasul. And then it goes on to quote a passage from um, Surah 36, where it's asking them to put uh, to 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 um, greet the the Nabi with um, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, peace and blessings be upon him, wa rahmatullah, and the, and the mercy of God be upon him. So that's just basically a passage from Surah 33, 36. It's actually also going to be discussed later, but I'm not going to get into it now. Um, the interesting word here is where it says, Ya Yuha Aladina Amanu. So when, uh, oh, um, uh, it's, it, usually they translate that as saying, Oh, ye, plural you, um, Aladina Amanu, those the, who, who believe. Correct. And yes, this is uh, the key word which we have here is. Uh, yeah, ayuha. Ayuha is a really important word because this word refers to a plurality of things, a multitude of things. There is a verse in the uh, well. We'll get into it another time because it's 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 a a whole other discussion. So we'll move on um, from here. Surah um, um, Surah four verse one seven one begins. Ya al al kitab, O people of the book, mm -hmm. don't don't go to taglu. Don't be extreme. 
Uh, yeah, for dinkum. Now, din, of course, in Arabic is what they think means religion, the religion of, of Islam. But for Judah Arabic, din means justice, laws, um, and judgment. So it's Correct. saying, don't, but don't be extreme in your judgment. Don't be extreme in justice. So it's a be, be, be lenient in your judgments. Don't, don't cut off people's heads. Don't cut off people's hands. Uh, you know, don't stone people to death. Don't whip them. It's, it's don't, this is exactly what it means. It's quite ironic that by changing the meaning of one word, deen, from justice into religion, suddenly you're allowed to do all that horrible stuff. And in fact, you're not allowed to believe spiritual things. So, but from the Judah Arabic point of view, this is saying, don't be extreme. Don't be fanatical. That's what it's actually saying. Don't be fanatic in your deen, in your justice, in the administry of justice. And it goes on and it says, and don't say concerning God anything other than al-haq, the truth. And mm -hmm. here's a, the first word here. Enma, enma, enma means verily, truly, indeed. In, um, uh -huh. yeah. Indeed, the Messiah Isa ibn Maryam, the, the, the Messiah Jesus, son of Maryam, Isa is just, uh, by the way, Isus, without the Greek suffix. You take away us and you've got Isa. That's basically a transliteration there. So that's the Greek form without the us suffix. So the Messiah Jesus, son of Mary, um, uh, and it says here it was Rasul Allah, was, or as I'm saying, this is understood as Roshel, the chief angel of God, God's chief angel, were Kalimat, uh, Kalat Mahu and his, and his word which he conveyed unto Maryam, mm -hmm. and Wa Ruh Minhu, and his spirit. So these three things here are again only really relevant for, for Jews because we, uh, we focus on the Old Testament, of course, the Tanakh. And in the Tanakh, we've got what we call theophanies, when, um, the, when God comes and visits the, the people of Abraham and gives us help throughout the whole Bible. The whole story is about how the theophanies of, of God are coming to help us and guide us and you know, take us out of bondage and various things like that. And it's got, the theophanies are in three forms, always in three forms. Um, it either appears as, as a, the angel of the Lord or the word of the Lord appeared, or the spirit of the Lord. So this prophet encounters the angel of the Lord, that prophet encounters the spirit of the Lord, or the word of the Lord comes to Abraham. So these three things are the ways that, uh, that, it's, it's say it, it, that, that the th theophanies, the appearances of God, appear throughout the Tanakh. So this is really relevant for Jews again. So it's saying that Jesus is th uh, these three things. It's saying um, that the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, is the, is the angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord, and the word of the Lord, which appeared throughout the Old Testament. And, um, uh, and it says, um, so, and, and, uh, and, um, so, believe, so believe in God and his Russell and his archangels, uh, mm -hmm. Rosh, Roshin chiefs, chief angels. These are the people would have thought that in Judaism, these are three different archangels, the word of the Lord, the, the angel of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord, the three different archangels. So it's, so it's this Russell here doesn't refer to any other messengers. It only refers to these three. And it's saying, so believe in God and these three messengers, which are, and, and do not say, well, and do not, and do not say, uh, thalatha. don't say three, desist. And then it says that God is one God. So it's saying that these three are not three. These three are one. Uh, this is not a reference to the Trinity. It's one person. Is that what you're saying? It's referring yeah. to the same person? Okay. It's that's saying that the word of God, the, the, the angel of the Lord, the, the word of the Lord, and the spirit of the Lord are, are not three different uh, messengers. They are one. These Russell, these plural, these, these messengers are one. And that is, a, a, of course, a, a mini trinity, uh, the, the idea of, of, you know, Jesus being God from God, life from light, true God from true God, therefore a kind of a trinity in his own right, trinity from trinity. So uh, this, is a, this is a view which was very common in early Christianity. We've talked about it before on the channel, but um, it's not so common these days. You know, we, we do refer to Jesus as the, 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 the word, the, tr the, the way, the truth and the life, the prophet, the priest and the king. There are different, they're all like many little sort of, triad phrases which you use to refer to him and it's that he's a he's basically a trinity it says don't call him three i want you to point out to to readers 
if they can see the difference between this rasam here, this little shape, all you have to do is know the shape. Look at the shape here. Look at the shape underneath. The right. shape underneath. Yeah, this is this this shape underneath. This is al thaluth. This is thaluth. This is how you say Trinity in Arabic, and this is how you've always said Trinity in Arabic with the, the liturgies. Right, Arabic and, and liturgies the, 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 the Arab Christians will say that for the Trinity, basically. That's right, and it's it's in the ancient Arabic liturgies. It's 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 always been used as the word for Trinity. It's it's curiously a word which is completely and entirely missing from the from the from the Abbasid Quran. It just doesn't exist. So every time we think it's attacking Thaluth, the Trinity, it's not attacking Trinity. It's, it's attacking the, the idea of saying that these th these three are not one. If you're saying so, these three are three, then then you're then you're wrong. That's basically what the, it's saying. So, Joe, uh, again, just to clarify what I'm understanding from you, uh, from, from a Jewish perspective, yeah. this is not an attack on a Trinity. It's actually attack on a triad that the Jews have in mind concerning. Uh, let's say in this case the uh, theophany of god or yeah. or uh, you know uh, things of that regard so it's showing that actually it is isa ibn maryam who is the one that possessed these three uh, persons which is kind of like rubbing it in their face i mean is that fair to say yes it's saying well it's saying that uh, you're wrong if you think these three um theophanies described in the tanakh if you mm -hmm. think that they are three different people you're wrong these three are one these three are Jesus. That's right. what it's saying. Okay, so yeah. really, and, um, and it's not. This, yeah. this is this is what you're doing is is completely changing the way we've read this before because we've yes. always assumed this is an attack against the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What you're saying is no. This is an attack from a. Ju it's really an attack against Jews about their theophanies in the Old Testament, and that these three yeah. these theophanies are not. This is not Jesus. Now these are the three th theophanies who are archangels, really. And that they are one, but they are one what? They are Jesus. So this is saying, you know Jesus. what? You're, they're saying, right, right. This is what it's they're saying. They're the person of Jesus, yeah. It's saying that these three theophanies that you're familiar with, they're not three. Don't say three. They are one, and his name is Jesus, the Messiah. That's what it's saying. It's kind of really uh, attacking a Judaic position here. You understand? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because it's almost like confirming now uh, what the Bible uh, would teach. Like, for instance, yes. in First Samuel 3, it talks about uh, uh, Yahweh revealing himself in his word. That's one uh, form of theophany. The angel of the Lord appearing to Hagar, that's another form of theophany. It's interesting, really. And, you know, for the first time, uh, Joe, it's kind of like you look at it and say, okay, uh, I can see why the Quran did not mention Thaluth because... It should have mentioned Thaluth. That's yeah. the common uh, term for the Trinity among the Arab Christians in those days. So now you can look at it differently. I see. Yeah. So it's 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 really um, uh, and and you look at that verse and then suddenly, rather than being like a disjointed collection thing, suddenly this is one very consistent message. Jesus is the the theophanies of the Old Testament is Jesus. He is one not three different theophanies unrelated angels those angels are one that's what it's saying for a start and then it goes on and gets even even better <laughs> okay so, basically, basically so what this, you're saying is this is really this is really confronting uh confronting the jewish notion of the archangels in the yeah. old testament and it's saying yes. this is jesus all the way through all those theophanies that you've been that you see in your tanakh they are actually jesus uh, when he yes. entered time and space before he came to yes. earth a thousand years ago. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So we have this. Um, uh, so we, we saw before. So the first thing it's saying is that, you know, this temple mount is not, is not the Mahmed. The Rasul is the Mahmed. And here it's very clearly saying, and by the way, that Rasul is Jesus. So it's just going on in the same theme. This is one theme in the mind. Uh, really trying to hammer home the idea that Jesus is these things. And, and then it goes on further. Then it gets, it gets bigger. You know, we've already seen, it's already attacked the idea of adoptionist on the outside, which, which is not, not a very big um, problem. The very first thing on the outside wall, uh, it's not a very big thing for many Jews because they might think that that's attacking the Jewish position. This is on the outside before they get in. So they might feel comfortable to go inside when they see that. And they go inside and they see this verse for Deuteronomy. They feel comfortable to read on. They haven't see, They haven't uh, understood that, that Allah al-Rahman al-Rahim refers to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So they're comfortable to read on. 
And it's then saying, you know what, this spot that you're standing on is not the cherished thing of Israel. The cherished thing of Israel is God's servant and, and Rashul, Rasul, Roshel. And then um, it, it gives you this saying, uh, do a blessing on the prophet. This could be understood as the Nabi could be understood as Moses and those who sit in Moses' seat. That's also, uh, I wasn't going to go into it now because it's kind of off the point and you'd ask me to keep onto the track. But this is also making you feel comfortable as a Jew. The Nabi as, uh, refers to the rabbinate, those who sit in the seat of Moses. And okay. that's why Let's it has a plural form. Let's here. just keep back to the. To Let's the keep words. on going. So yeah. then it makes you feel comfortable. And then you read on. And it says, don't be extreme in your justice, which many Jews would feel, yes, I, would, I wish they weren't so harsh on me. For example, I lost my brother um, who was stoned to death for adultery, and I wish they wouldn't be so harsh in their justice. So that's kind of also on the side. And you, you've got their attention. You've got your foot in the door. It's, it, it's a great sales pitch, to be honest. And then suddenly it's saying, suddenly, <laughs> after it's got you feeling comfortable, suddenly it smashes this in your face. Jesus is the Messiah. Those um, theophanies that you're familiar with from the Old Testament, they are one person and his name is Jesus. Uh, don't call them three. They are one. So that's really a fascinating sort of first thing. OK, so there you see the first uh, few walls, one on the outside and the first uh, three on the inside, um, uh, basically presenting uh, a getting the, the Jewish visitors to this most holy site for, for Jews into a comfortable place. Um, and, and then suddenly sort of uh, whacking them in the face with the idea that these three theophanies are actually one person and that he is called the Messiah and he's Jesus Christ. So um, that's, that's the first step. There's more to come, but we'll, let's, let's stop it at this point. Um, the uh, it's, it's a, there are going to be people who are going to say hold on this place is off limits to jews these days yes it's it is there's a reason why we'll get into that in the next part but what do you think of it so far al fadi well i mean uh joe what did you bring a very interesting view obviously and and i think jay mentioned this earlier that uh, uh, all uh, all along uh, you know uh, we've been at least uh, you know um, conditioned maybe the word or or at least believe that it's an attack, these inscriptions, primarily an attack on Christian doctrine, especially the Trinity. Uh, but the perspective that you bring in is really intriguing, interesting, and it does also make sense. I mean, there isn't anything odd in it, uh, if you wish. In fact, uh, what caught my attention, the fact that, uh, you know, the absence of the term thaluth to describe the Trinity using the Arabic uh, or the Christian Arab way of talking about the Trinity. Uh, rather, it's talking about Thalatha, which is the three theophanies that you're mentioning here. It, it does have a strong support for this view that you're bringing in. I mean, all, all, all that to say is that uh, here again, we are looking at yet another possibility that still proves that either the origin of the Quran or the origin of Islam or the origin of some of these primary teachings that made its way into uh, the pages of the Quran actually had a completely different meaning and there has been an evolution in its interpretation and its reading. And of course, the lack of harakat, of course, diacritical markings and dottings add to the dilemma, uh, at least the dilemma that our Muslim friends are going to face. Exactly, exactly. Well, Joel, thank you so much. Thank you also, Al-Fadi, for coming on board to help us out. Uh, I, I find it fascinating, Joel, that what you have done, you have brought in your Jewish background, you brought in your also your understanding of the Tanakh in the Old Testament, and you're looking and saying, and it's very clear, and that, that was good to hear what you're saying, that this building at this spot on this site, the Holy of Holies, this is the Temple Mount, this is a Jewish spot, therefore these inscriptions make sense, would only make sense if they're directed at Jews. Otherwise, they would have built this building nearer to the, uh, the Church of the Sepulchre or somewhere uh, other, in other parts of, uh, of Jerusalem. But the fact that it's built here is because it is an attack um, uh, by Abdul Malik. And who is Abdul Malik? As we have been saying, he was a Christian. He was a monophysite Christian. And what's fascinating, is if that is the case and you're looking at it from the Jewish standpoint, making them comfortable as they come in from the, the northwest wall, then going to the southern wall where uh, the word Muhammad, the praised one, is then introduced, uh, reflecting what we see in Deuteronomy 32, and then going to the south 
Eastern Wall uh, on the idea of, of no, don't go beyond your justice, uh, your justice, and then really hammering them home in the Eastern Wall with this idea of the Theophanies, the three archangels who are really, these are Jesus. They, he is the pre-existent one. He is the one right through the Tanakh. Fascinating that you brought it from that standpoint. Now, that's not, those of you who are listening may not agree. You may not under, uh, want to you, you, would, you, you may not want to follow it that way. Nonetheless, we'd like to hear your re responses. We'd like to hear your comments. See what Joe is doing, because he does come from a Jewish background. He sees it differently than the rest of us would see it. We do need to hear that side. We, we do need to uh, also make sure that we not only pay attention to it, but ask ourselves, is this really the intent? Was this the reasoning? We've already said many times, don't look at these inscriptions, don't look at the coins, don't look at what's happening in the 7th century and impose a 9th century understanding onto it. Don't do that. That is what everybody does. And that's a difficulty where we have always started, haven't we, Al-Fadi? We start from the premise that you go to the 7th century, you look at the artifacts that are there, and you read them as they are in the context that they are, in the environment that you find them, so that we can understand what the author is intending. That's proper exegesis. And you've done that here, Joe, uh, from your perspective. You're saying, let's make sure that the author, in this case, Abdel Malik, who is he confronting? I don't necessarily agree with everything you've said tonight. That's fine. I would suggest that there's still a political entity and there's also a theological co confrontation going on. Both need to be taken into, uh, in, in, into the context of what we're referring to. Nonetheless, let's see what the rest of you say. You've got the comments at the bottom. Do comment. Joe has promised that he is going to be looking at them and he will come back to you and he will respond. Okay, Al-Fadi, hundreds of miles away. And uh, our good friend Joe down the bottom here, you're thousands of miles away. <laughs> It's great to get together. Thanks for waking up at five in the morning. This is Jay, Joe, and Al-Fadi, over and out.